Good afternoon, sir. Can you see and hear us? Yes, thank you. Mr Whitaker, moving please to your knowledge of the Lee Castleton case. Um, is it right that you have no independent recollection of this involvement now? That's correct. Um, but you've had an opportunity to look at the papers that have been sent to you by the inquiry. Uh -huh. um, and you've addressed this um, at paragraph 99 of your statement. Um, and the paragraph's on from there. So please do feel free to refer to that statement if you need to. Can you explain, please, having reviewed the documents, how you came to provide advice to Catherine Oglesby in relation to Mr. Castleton's case in early 2004? Uh, as far as I, I can recall, looking at the, uh, at the documents, um, Kath Oglesby contacted me for advice. Uh, I would imagine she would have explained the situation to me and, and, and asked for a, a view in regard to the uh, case. And what did she tell you about the case? Uh, I understood that, um, that Mr Castleton uh, had been experiencing uh, losses in his accounts, uh, that he, he, he wasn't, he wasn't aware of, of where they were coming from. He'd contacted her at an early stage um, and she'd got involved um, in regard to that and, 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 and was working with him. Uh, to understand why these losses had occurred in uh, the accounts of his post office. And what advice was she seeking from you? I think she was a view, uh, 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 well, I think she was a view whether it would be taken on by the um, investigation team as, a, as an investigation case. And you say in your statement that you felt this was not a matter for criminal investigation. Can you explain why you thought that was the case? Well, from how it was explained to me by um, Kath Oglesby that, that Mr Castleton had, had, had discovered um, uh, shortages in his, his account and he wasn't sure where they'd come from. He'd sort of um, spoken to her at a very, very early stage and was looking to work with her to understand um, why that had happened and, uh, and what could be done about it. Uh, and essentially, he he um, he brought the issue to her at a very very early stage, looking for resolution. Did you have any further involvement in the Lee Castleton case after that discussion with Catherine Oglesby? Well, I, to I told her that I didn't think it was uh, a. a something for the criminal investigation team to, uh, to get involved with. Uh, and after that, I don't recall any involvement whatsoever. Turning to your involvement in the criminal prosecution of Alison Henderson, it's right, isn't it, that you were the second interviewer to Christopher Knight in an interview with Ms. Henderson, which took place on the 11th of March, 2010? Yeah, from the records, I, I could say that was. Again, do you recall that interview now? Uh, not specifics of it. I, re I recall um, going to, travelling to Norwich, and, and, and I recall an interview in the, um, I think it was in Royal Mail prom premises in Norwich, but the specifics of the interview, I, I don't recall. Is it right that your understanding at the time of the interview, as you say in your statement, was that Mrs. Henderson could not explain the loss at her branch, but you were not aware of any specific allegations relating to the Horizon system? From the documents that I've seen, I, I, that, that would be the case, yeah. And you were, as far as you're aware, not involved in any decision-making in respect of Mrs. Henderson's case? No, I wasn't. Nor, nor did you have any further involvement? I didn't, know. In respect of the criminal prosecution of Alison Hall, you were the second interviewer again um, in the, it, to Christopher Knight in Ms. Hall, Ms. Hall's case. Is that right? Uh, according to the records, I was, yeah, although I don't specifically recall it. 
And so you don't specifically recall that interview, but you've had a chance to look at the documents that have been sent to you about your involvement. Yes, yeah, similarly, I do recall uh, travelling to uh, Cleckheaton and, uh, and an interview at a solicitor's office in Cleckheaton. Um, but uh, beyond that, I, I, don't, I don't recall. And that's the interview that took place on the 28th of September 2010, is that right? Yep. And you say in your statement that to the best of your knowledge, you were not aware of any allegations made by Ms Hall about the Horizon system, is that right? I don't believe so at the time. Um, and again, I'm just going through, through the transcripts of the interview and the documents that have been shown. But based on that, I don't, I don't believe I would be. To the best of your knowledge, were you involved in any decision making in relation to Ms Hall's case? No, I wasn't. Did you have any further involvement apart from the interview that you're aware of? I think I produced a statement um, later, but it was uh, essentially a production statement, um, I think, um, in relation to the interview. Turning, please, to your knowledge of Horizon issues, um, you didn't, at least at the, at the time of making your statement, recall any specific dealings with Gareth Jenkins, is that right? That's correct, yeah. You have very recently been provided with an email dated the 8th of March 2010, which was sent by Steve Bradshaw to you and others, enclosing a report prepared by Gareth Jenkins. Yeah. Have you had an opportunity to look at that email and the attached document? Uh, briefly, it was only sent very, very recently. Could we have that on screen, please? So the email references POL 001-67364. You can see the other recipients there, yourself among them, and an explanation in the body of the email that the attached document had been sent by John Longman. Do you remember John Longman? Yeah, I recall John Longman, yeah. Who was he? Uh, John was a, a, a Post Office Limited Investigation Manager working, um, I think it was sort of in the Hertfordshire, London area. Can you recall anything about the circumstances in which you received this email? Uh, no. Going then to the attachment, could we have that on screen, please? It is POL 001 67365. We can see uh, that the author of this document is Gareth Jenkins. It is marked a final draft. And scrolling down to the bottom of this page, please. There is a date at the bottom right of the 2nd of October 2009. The abstract, going further up again, please, is as follows. This document describes the measures that are built into Horizon to ensure data integrity. Do you recall reading this document at the time you were sent it? I don't recall the document at all, I'm afraid. Does it follow that you can't help with what you understood its purpose to be? Uh, I'm afraid I can't. Could we have on screen, please, document reference FUJ 
going please to page eight of this document first. And scrolling down, please. This is an email from you to Jane Owen, dated the 9th of June, 2011. <coughs> And you say this, Jane, I currently have a police liaison inquiry centred on St John Green's sub-post office Rotherham. Briefly, the office was audited and found to be approximately 11k short and a clerk is suspected and has been interviewed. The case has been reviewed and the police officer has asked me to get a statement demonstrating the robustness of the Horizon system at the branch. The case is unusual as the branch is operated by a charity and because of this, we were asked to get involved at the outset in order to possibly mitigate the adverse publicity of us demanding our money back from them. Going back, please, please to page seven. And scrolling down a bit further down that page. We see Jane Owen forwarding your email to Penny Thomas also on the 9th of June. Hi Penny, just wanted to run this by you before I make any kind of formal request. I assume that we will just requ request a statement as normal, but would need to push it around some dates, question mark, Jane. And then further up the page. Penny Thomas replies to Jane Owen, suggesting identifying the time frame when the funds were missing, reported missing, and asking Fujitsu to provide help desk call analysis. Then page six, please. A little further down the page, Jane Owen gets back to you, forwarding Penny Thomas's suggestion. Page five, please. This is your response on the 9th of June. Jane, at present, the police haven't asked for Horizon records, although I'm sure that if they know we can provide them, they will ask for them and then not use them. All the officer asked was if we could provide a statement saying that the Horizon system was operating correctly in the run-up to the shortage being identified. And then page four, please. is Jane Owen on the 10th of June to you asking whether she should uh, go for six months initially and noting that this would come off your allocation even if you were not getting the transactional data. Bottom of page three please. You appear in that email to agree to six months. Then further up the page, we have an email from you to Maureen Moores, dated the 6th of July, which reads as follows. Maureen, this is the stuff I wanted from Andy Dunks. There has, been, there has not been an ARQ in respect to this. All the police wanted was a statement to say that the horizon appeared to be working okay at the branch in the run-up to the audit shortage. If he can't do it, then I will have to tell the police as such. Then going to page two, please. Your, your email seems to be sent to Andy Dunks, who says at the top of the page, please, in an email directly to you, Paul, I am unable to say for definite that the Horizon system was working okay. What I can do is look at all calls logged by this PO during the date range and state that there were no faults reported by the PO to suggest any faults. If you want me to get the calls extracted to examine the calls, we will need ARQ numbers to cover this request. Please let me know what you would like us to do. And then page one, please. About halfway down the page, you say this. No need for anything beyond this, Andy. I have explained to the police that all you can say is that no faults were logged and they are happy with that. And finally, Andy Dunk's response further up the page. 
And he says, Paul, I think you may have misinterpreted my email. I have not said that no faults were logged. What I'm saying is that if you want me to extract the calls logged so, I, so that I can examine them to see if there are any fault calls during these dates. This appears to be an example of you seeking a catch-all statement from Andy Dunks in relation to a case where the police had asked for assurances about the Horizon system. It also appears that Andy Dunks was not able to provide a catch-all statement in this instance. And the reason he gave for that was that he was unable to say for definite that the Horizon system was working okay. Did you take this to mean that there could be faults in Horizon with the potential to affect evidence in criminal cases? I think it's difficult to say. Um, I think around this time, around just uh, this is when the sort of initial um, sort of raising of, of the, um, the question of horizon reliability was, was sort of gathering pace. As I say, my, my background was that it had always been sort of uh, in, infallible. Uh, and, and certainly, I, I don't think it had been tested in court yet. And I think the, the, um, the, the sort of underlying um, message was, be, was, was that, you know, until we get something coming back certain to say definitely, uh, uh, you know, Horizon's um, at fault, to, to sort of carry on in the belief that it's not. Um, so I think I think these emails, and as I say, I, I, I don't know because they, whilst there was a, a, a trail of them, I don't know where they sit in amongst other things. I, I think that's um, I think that's probably what I can say about about the emails. Turning, please, to the document um, which prompted your memory of sub-postmasters raising horizon integrity issues before you left the post office. The reference is POL 0011-4310. Starting about halfway down the page, this is an email from you to Clive Burton, dated the 17th of June, 2010. Who was Clive Burton? I don't recall the name, but if, if you scroll up and I can see his job title, I might be able to uh, illuminate a little bit. It former agent's like, debt? Yeah, it looked like someone who, in, in the former agent's debt team, so when, when sub, sub postmasters left the organisation for, for any reason they were the organ they were the part of the um, uh, part of the post office that dealt with um, debts left behind whether anything was owed to sub postmasters or any or whether sub postmasters owed anything to the sub post uh, to post office limited. And the subject of the email was old Conway Colwyn and Conway Road, and you say this. Clive, I interviewed both Mrs. McKillum and M Mrs. McKillum, um, Jenkins, and both answered no comment to my questions. This case is one of a few that we currently hold that really is dependent on the outcome of cases, whereby the integrity of the Horizon system has been called into question. In effect, a test case is being put through the course relating to this, and as such, other cases are being put on hold until its outcome. This is one of the cases. Basically, we are waiting to see if the test case goes through with a horizon challenge before deciding what to do with some of the others. Not ideal, but hopefully this keeps you up to speed. What did you mean by a test case in this email? I think that was a term that was being used around the organisation, or certainly the investigation um, uh, team. Um, as I say, I, um, I recall... I recall interviewing um, Mrs. McWilliam and Mrs. McWilliam Jenkins, uh, as I said in the in the email there, um, and, and 
I recall that they, um, you know, similar to many, uh, in in regards to, to to events at the moment, that that um, they they said that um, they they didn't know. Um, well, there was losses at the office, audit shortages at the office, and they didn't know where the loss had come from. Uh, and I, I, I don't know whether I co recall that they did actually specifically say that uh, it was um, Horizon. Certainly, I, I mean, well, it looks like they answered no comment, so um, so maybe not. But I do recall that they, them being in North Wales, um, I recall that Mr Bradshaw, Steve Bradshaw, who was a, an investigator, he had a he had a case in North Wales that was being questioned. There was another couple around North Wales that was being questioned. Um, so that sort of gave rise to my thinking that it was possibly something that was geographically based around North Wales. Um, and as I say, it, it, from, from reading the uh, email there, it looked to be that, um, that, the, uh, that, that there was talk of, of, of cases going through and, um, you know, and, and the answers, uh, sorry, and the, um, the Horizon system integrity being part of that case and being uh, being questioned. And as I say, I, I, I believe that's where it, it was just generally referred to that a, a test case was being put through, and that was the the, the terms that that, that was used. Uh, I don't know whether that was a, a, ever officially said to us. It was a test case, or it, it was just sort of the, the vernacular that was used in regard to what was happening at the time. Does your email here reflect any doubt on your part as to the integrity of the Horizon system? I don't think it does. I think it's a we'll, we'll wait and see. Um, if if the if the challenge goes goes through, then. I think my view would have been well if the challenge, you know, if if the evidence shows that Horizon's flawed, then that's that. If the, you know, the challenge shows that Horizon isn't flawed, then that's that. The response from Clive Burton, further up the page, please. Was this Paul? Thanks for the update. I will hold the matter in abeyance for the time being. So it appears that further action on the case was held off pending the outcome of the test case you refer to. Is that your understanding? That's what it seems, seems to be. Do you recall being made aware of the outcome of the test case as you refer to it? I don't. I, I don't know whether it happened after I'd gone or... But I certainly don't recall um, the result of, of anything. Turning, please, to another document which has, I'm afraid, only been provided to you very recently. Could we have on screen, please, document reference POL This is an email from Jane Owen to a number of recipients, including you, dated the 29th of July, 2010. The subject line is duplication, Fujitsu, duplication of transaction records. We can see that Penny Thomas is BCC'd in. And the email begins as follows, all as you are aware, due to the recent problems with Fujitsu, all ARQ requests have been suspended. I can now advise that the enhancement to delete duplicated records from the returns has been developed and is due to be tested by Fujitsu at the weekend. You've had an opportunity to read this email. Do you recall receiving this email now? I don't specifically remember re uh, receiving the email. Do you recall being aware of this issue, the duplication of transaction records? Um, to be fair, I'm not sure that I do. Uh, as I say, I, it, 
I, I don't recall receiving the email, um, and it's certainly not something that stuck um, from that time. Could we have on screen, please, uh, paragraph 159 of Mr. Whitaker's statement? That's page 39 of WITN 0505010. Page 39, paragraph 159. You say here, it was my honestly held belief during the time I was investigating within Pol that Horizon was robust and would not erroneously produce spontaneous transactions that were not genuine. That was our over, the overriding narrative that I was being told and accepted. Does it remain your position, notwithstanding some of the later documents you've seen, that it was your belief that the Horizon system would not erroneously produce spontaneous transactions that were not genuine? Yes, as, as I mentioned at the start of my evidence this morning, um, it, 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 when I produced the statement, I thought it was across uh, the whole of my time in Post Office Limited. However, I accept that towards the very, very end, um, one or two documents pointed towards question marks over, uh, over Horizon but during the vast majority of my time within Post Office Limited, uh, I thought um, the Horizon system was robust and would not produce um, erroneous transactions or bugs um, or the things that it's proved to have done. Going please to page 41 of this statement, paragraph 171. You say this, reflecting on my personal performance during this time, I would say that in comparing the cases I investigated pre-Horizon and those post-Horizon rollout, I did not notice a significant increase in the audit shortage type cases. Over to paragraph 172, though I was not aware of the whole picture in regard, in regard to how many cases of a similar nature were being pursued by poll. I do not recall any significant increase in this type of investigation in the period after Horizon system implementation to that which I experienced before the system rollout. This may have affected my thinking in respect of my investigations, as if I had ha have noticed a sharp increase in cases after the implementation of Horizon. It may have raised my suspicions that the Horizon system was not performing as it should have. Notwithstanding that you did not notice an increase in audit shortage type cases, did it not concern you that from at least 2010, you were aware of multiple sub-postmasters actively alleging that apparent shortfalls were being caused by the Horizon system? I think towards the end of my uh, career with Post Office Limited, and I don't know whether that subconsciously that was um, uh, something that fed into the picture of why I left, but I could, I could see that there was a, a movement gathering pace, certainly. Uh, and somewhere along the line, there would have been half, Post Office Limited would have to prove one way or another whether the uh, Horizon system uh, was robust or, were, or, or if it was not. So uh, towards the end of my time within uh, Post Office Limited, I think it's, it's safe to say I, I, I sort of made that realization. A theme that you raise in a number of places in your statement is that you and other investigators were repeatedly and continually told that the Horizon system was robust. You say at paragraph 137 that the certainty of the message from the post office may have colored your judgment and that of other investigators in matters surrounding Horizon. Who was this message that Horizon was robust coming from? I think it was coming from whenever we asked for statements um, 
it always came back that the that the um, that the system was robust. When that when that evidence was tested, it was tested in court. If ever it was tested in court, um, more often than not, it would be that the um, that, that the convictions went through. Um, it, it was just, it was strange. It's just a general overall. It's the, that is the system. That's the system that, you, that that is used, and and just I suppose really the understanding that the post office had paid all that money for that system, and it was, it it it, it, it must have been robust. Um, however, obviously we were very very wrong in that assumption. You deal in the final two paragraphs of your statement, and this is the bottom of page forty one starting at 173, with your final reflections on your involvement in investigations and prosecutions where Horizon data was relied upon. How do you feel about that involvement as you sit here today? Well, I, as, as said in my statement there, the, the, the thought that somebody within uh, Post Office Limited or, or Fujitsu had knowledge that the Horizon system was flawed and didn't disclose that uh, and kept that to themselves for, for, for whatever reason, um, sits incredibly uncomfortably with me, um, particularly knowing that I was the, the face of Post Office Limited when going out and seeing people and essentially uh, causing upset and, and dis destroying their lives. Um, it, it, it does make me quite angry when I think about it. Um, I think, um, obviously, through my investigations, I've, I feel that I've been unwittingly, albeit unwittingly, used as an instrument of Post Office Limited and Fujitsu to perpetuate the myth that Horizon uh, was faultless. Uh, and as a result, I, I, that's brought s so much unnecessary distress and anguish to, to innocent people. Um, and like I say, it doesn't sit very well with me at all. Sir, those are all the questions that I have for Mr. Whitaker. Um, I, I'll turn to CPs to see if there are any questions from others. Yes, there are from Mr. Maloney, sir. Yeah. I'm sorry, sir, my microphone is struggling to turn on. No, it's on. Thank you. Mr. Whitaker, um, you said that you thought that Mrs. Alison Hall, who, who sits next to me, um, didn't raise the question of Horizon having anything to do with the discrepancies that she experienced. That, are, are you sure about that? I don't recall that she did, uh, and, and I, I was basing my answer on, on what, what I'd seen in the documentation. Apology, apologies if you did. It, I, it's, it's something that we can... Mr Knight, in fact, took the lead in the interview, didn't he? I believe so, yes. Yeah, and it's something we can do with, with him, but I just thought it best to raise with you, because and, and if we could put up on the screen um, POL 30s 21244... Um, we thought we provided this in advance, but if, if, I'll just read it to you, if I may, yeah. Mr. Mr. Whitaker. It's, it, it's at page four, and it can be checked if, if necessary. Um, but um, Mr. Knight, some four minutes and nine seconds into the interview, says to Mrs. Hall, right, so you're adamant that the £14,000 is nothing that you've done criminally, fraudulently, however you want to put it. And Mrs. Hall said... I've not taken a penny out of that post office criminally, I wouldn't dare. And Mr Knight says it's something to do with some sort of discrepancy. And Mrs Hall says, I think it's to do with discrepancy with the lottery, and I'm hoping that we can come to the bottom of this. 
And Mr Knight says, right. And Mrs Hall says, I'll pay any money back what's sold to the Post Office Limited. I'm not a thief. I'll pay anything back. But I just want all this to be looked at in detail. And because Horizon System's not 100%, if I've got all the details here, I'd like that to be, to be taken into account, please. And then she explains how it is that the, she's had problems with the lottery tickets and the discrepancies have built up and built up and built up, and she doesn't know where the discrepancies come from. Does that assist with your memory as to her talking about unexplained discrepancies and mentioning that Horizon System's not 100%? It would certainly seem uh, consistent. As I said, I don't specifically recall it, but I've got no reason to, to dispute what was, uh, what's in the um, transcript. Thank you very much, Mr Whitaker. Uh, it doesn't appear there are any other questions from core participants. Thank you. Um, well, thank you, um, Mr. Whitaker, for making your witness statement and for um, answering a great many questions uh, today. Um, although the focus of the questioning has not been on Mrs. Hall's case. Um, I welcome Mrs. Hall to the inquiry, and I hope that she's found it informative. And um, do you want a break before the next witness, uh, Ms. Price? Sir, I'm afraid we do need a short break because the next witness appears remotely and some uh, manoeuvring needs to be done to sort out the screen, I'm afraid. So we yeah. do need a short break of 10 minutes, uh, which I'm told my watch is fast, so I'll um, allow you, sir, to tell me when 10 minutes takes us to. Well, I'll just have a look at um, the most reliable um, machine I have in front of me, which says 14.48, so 3 o'clock, uh, Ms. Price. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon, sir. Can you Good see and hear us? Yes, I can. May we please call Miss Oglesby? Certainly. I can see you, but the sound isn't very good. Is that better? That's better, yes. Okay. Um, I'm the usher, and I'm going to take you through your affirmation. If you like to just repeat after me, I do solemnly. I do solemnly. Sincerely and truly. Sincerely and truly. Declare and affirm. Declare and affirm. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence I shall give. Shall be the truth. Shall be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Thank you. So we're, we're having an issue at the moment in that we can't actually see Ms Oglesby. Um, I think someone is trying to resolve that. I'm sorry, sir. I think you're on mute. On mute. I was just saying I've got the advantage of you because I can mm. see her. Well, uh, that's good, sir. <laughs> there we are. Could you confirm your full name, please, Miss Oglesby? Catherine Oglesby. You should have with you a hard copy of your witness statement, um, and it's dated the 4th of June, 2023. If you can turn to page 36 of that, please. Yes. Do you have a copy with a visible signature? Yes, I do. And is that your signature? Yes, it is. Are the contents of that statement true to the best of your knowledge and belief? Yes. For the purposes of the transcript, the document references WITN 085-301-00. Thank you for 
coming to the inquiry remotely to assist it in its work and for providing the witness statement that you have. As you know, I will be asking questions on behalf of the inquiry. Today, I'm going to be asking you about issues which arise in phase four of the inquiry, focusing on your involvement in the proceedings brought by the post office against Mr. Castleton, relating to alleged losses at the Marine Drive post office branch. You joined the post office in 1982 at the age of 16 as a counter clerk, is that right? Yes, that's right. And five years later in 1987, you were promoted to manager of that branch? Yes, that's right. And at that point you became a retail line manager? No, not at that point. Apologies. You say you moved more roles when you returned to work, so... Looking at your statement, can you assist us then with when you became a retail line manager? Yes, I, from returning from maternity leave in approximately 1997. Yes, so January 1997, uh, you became a retail line manager? Yes. Yes. You've set out an explanation of the change in terminology relating to the retail line manager role over the years at paragraph seven of your statement. And you say the title changed from retail line manager to retail network manager, then to area sales manager, and then to area manager. Did the role remain substantially the same despite these changes to the title? Yes, substantially the same. And you held this role from 1997 to 2005 in the, in the Postmaster Network. Yes, correct. 2005 to 2010 in the Directly Managed Network. Yes. And 2017 to date, again in the Postmaster Network, is that right? Yes, it is. So apart from a period between 2015 and 2017, when you were not working for the post office, your entire career has been with the post office, is that right? Yes. And you re remain employed by the post office now? Yes, I do. You've set out at paragraph eight of your witness statement some aspects of the roles you have held since becoming a retail line manager in 1997. And you go on to say that one of those aspects is no longer part of the role, namely suspensions and termination of contracts. Is, uh, and you say this is now the responsibility of the contracts team, is that right? Yes, that's right. But it was part of your role in 2003? Yes, correct. Do you recall when suspensions and termination of contracts became the responsibility of the contracts team? No, sorry, I don't. You were the retail line manager who took the decision to terminate Mr. Castleton's contract, is that right? Yes. And at the outset of your statement for the inquiry, you have expressed your sympathy to all sub-postmasters who were affected by Horizon-related issues, and in particular, Mr. Castleton. You say that when you made the decision to terminate Mr. Castleton's contract, this was based on an understanding that the Horizon system was working as it should. Should we understand your evidence against that backdrop? Yes, please. You also say in your statement that during your time at the post office, you were reassured that the Horizon IT system was robust and working properly. Is that right? That's right, yes. Who was it who was providing that reassurance? Um, I contacted several different places. So I was getting messages back from Fujitsu 
and from the Business Support Centre and the Horizon System help desk. And do you mean that in the specific sense of the Horizon System working properly in relation to Mr Castleton, or when you're talking about reassurance that the system was work robust and working properly, do you mean that more broadly? Uh, both, really. So during Mr Castleton's um, case, I was contacting them to make sure everything was OK when Mr Castleton was asking me questions, and in the broader sense as well through my career, yes. Starting, please, with your understanding of Mr Castleton's contract with the post office. You say at paragraph 16 of your statement to the inquiry that when there was a loss, it was for the sub-postmaster to make that loss good. And in your statement, you don't qualify that. Was it your understanding that a sub-postmaster's contract imposed an obligation on a sub-postmaster to make good any loss, no matter the circumstances? Um. Could you just repeat the question in a different way then, please? I'm not really... Of in... course. If you want to look at paragraph 16 of your statement to the inquiry... Yes, I've got that. You say that when there was a loss, it was yes. for the sub-postmaster to make that loss good. Yes. And you don't, in, in that aspect of your statement, qualify in that in any way. So my question is, was it your understanding that the contract imposed an obligation on a sub-postmaster to make good any loss, no matter the circumstances? I think under some circumstances, they wouldn't be expected to make the loss good. So, for instance, perhaps a robbery or something of that, that case. Or a burglary, you know, if the, the money had been stolen in a robbery or a burglary. Was the position adopted by the post office that apparent shortfalls, irrespective of how they came about, were the responsibility of sub-postmasters to make good? In their day-to-day -day working, yes. You say at paragraph 23 of your statement that the usual role of a retail line manager when a sub-postmaster reported a loss, was limited to telling the sub-postmaster to ring the business support centre for advice. What yes. was your understanding of what the business support centre could do to assist the sub-postmaster in these circumstances? Um, it would be to signpost them to try and help them find where the loss might have occurred. So maybe to go through and get them to check their stock again, get them to add the cash up, um, maybe contact Gyro Bank and Savings Bank to see if any paperwork that had left the office was incorrect. Maybe contact the Chesterfield Department to see if there was an error notice pending. So if anything had left the branch, to try and help them in, in finding where the error might be. I appreciate that it is your evidence that you went beyond simply signposting Mr Castleton to the Business Support Centre. But do you think that simply telling sub-postmasters to ring the Business Support Centre was sufficient support from a line manager for sub-postmasters dealing with losses? Probably not, no, with hindsight. You say at paragraph 26 of your statement that it was normal for most branches to have small losses and gains each week and even to have a large loss or gain from time to time when an error had occurred. By error... Do you mean error on the part of sub-postmasters or their staff? Yes, I do. So that if they'd sent something that had left the office and that was incorrect, it would cause an error. 
you also say at paragraph 26 of your statement that where errors did not come to light, they were the responsibility of the sub-postmaster to make good. Is that right? Yes. Should we take it from your evidence in this paragraph that as far as you were concerned, unless an error on the part of the sub-postmaster could be identified, the loss was taken to be the loss and the sub-postmaster was liable to pay that sum to the post office? Yes. In preparing your statement to the inquiry about your involvement in Mr. Castleton's case, you have refreshed your memory from a document entitled Marine Drive Post Office Summary of Events. Can we have that document on screen, please? The reference is LCAS 40699. Going please to the second page of that document. Is this a document that you prepared? Yes, it is. When did you produce it and why? I can't exactly recall the exact date. I've looked through several times to see if there's any um, hint at a date when I prepared it. Um, I think I'll have probably prepared it round about when I requested the audit to, to make a summary of what was happening so that I could recall the events. But I don't know exactly because I've not, I can't remember and I haven't put a date on, on it anywhere. Is it right that you are reliant in your memory of events on this document and it informed your witness statement prepared for the inquiry? Yes. yes. You say here on the first page at the top that the first time Mr Castleton contacted you about issues at his branch was between Christmas and New Year 2003 to report a loss of £1,100. Is that right? Yes. And this was the first time Mr Castleton had experienced any major balancing issues since he'd taken over as sub-postmaster the previous July? Yes, that's in my notes there, yes. And he came to you to declare this apparent discrepancy, didn't he? Yes, he did. What did Mr. Castleton say to you about the apparent shortfall? I can't remember the conversation because it's obviously a long time ago. I can just refresh my memory from what I've written there. Um, that he told me was £1,100 short in his cash. And what suggestions did you make to Mr. Castleton? Um, quite a common error was when um, a branch was doing a, a business deposit, so a deposit for a business, they would deposit cash and cheques. Um, it was only the cash figure that should be entered onto the horizon system. The cheque figure just went off separately. But quite often the customer would either add the cheques in or the branch would add the cheques in by mistake and then that would create quite a large um, loss. So at that point, I, I told Mr. Castleton to contact uh, Gyro Bank, which is where the, that sort of an error would come to account. National savings, because those could be large amounts of deposits into people's accounts um, to see if anything could come to light and, and bring any light on the error. Is it right that you also asked Mr Castleton to make the loss good, as an error notice might take up to eight weeks to arrive? Yes, looking at my notes there, I did, yes. 
so you were, in effect, advising him to accept the loss, sign off the accounts, even though he did not think they were accurate? Well, he would have shown the 1,100 shot in his account, so he would be signing to say he had a shortage in the account. But you were encouraging him to make good on the basis that it would all come out in the wash with an error notice. Is that right? That's what I was hoping, yes. And on this occasion, Mr Castleton did make good the loss, didn't he? Yes, he said he could make good the loss, yes. Mr Castleton balanced fine for the next three weeks, you say in your note, something you noted on your visit to the branch on the 16th of January 2004. Yes, correct. When you visited the branch and found that nothing had come to light to explain the apparent shortfall, did you take any steps to investigate this or ask anyone else to look into it? I can't remember doing so, no, but as it was only three weeks or so after the loss, the error notices could take quite a long time to come back, so I didn't think anything... Um, untoward uh, anything at that point. The next time Mr Castleton tried to balance, he found an apparent shortfall of over £4,000. And your advice was again to contact Gyro Bank and Savings, wasn't it, according to your note of events? Yes, it was. And you also asked if the cash at the branch was kept secure and who had access to it. Correct, yes. Since Mr Castleton was unable on this occasion to make the amount good, you told him to contact the helpline to get a hardship form, is that right? Yes. Was the purpose of this so that the amount of the apparent shortfall could be held in the suspense account while the matter was investigated? Yes. Rather than Mr Castleton having to put the money in to balance and roll over into the next trading period? Well, with a hardship farm, it gave the postmaster the opportunity to pay back the loss over a period of time rather than all in one go. Um, and he could have deductions from remuneration rather than making it good there and then. You say you discussed ways to double check the work leaving the office and suggested to Mr Castleton that he perform a snapshot each evening and check the cash. Can you explain please what a snapshot was and why you were suggesting this? So on the horizon system, you could print what we call a snapshot, which is, as it sounds, it's a, a print off of everything that, that's happened in the branch at, at that particular time. So um, up to that point, when you print a snapshot up, it, it lists everything that's gone through the branch, all the pension dockets, all the gyro business. It also prints what the system thinks the cash should be in the till um, because obviously the system, as you sell a stamp, it increases the cash, decreases the stock. As you do a gyro bank deposit, it increases the cash and puts an entry on there. So you could double check everything up to that point that you were doing and it would give you a cash figure. So when you counted the cash that you physically had, if it matched the cash on the snapshot, you know you were balancing correctly. If there was a, a difference between the cash you had and the snapshot, then you were either had a gain or a shortfall, depending which way it was. Could we have on screen, please, document reference POL 3071159?
This is an email chain from June 2006. Can you see that, Miss Oglesby? Yes. And it's an email chain in the lead up to the trial in the Castleton case. And about two thirds of the way down the page is an email from Stephen Dilley to Vicky Harrison, a contracts and services manager. And he's seeking information following receipt of a letter from Mr. Castleton's solicitors. And at point two at the bottom of the page there, he says, Castleton states that a complete set of balance snapshots for each day's trading until this suspension was produced and removed from the branch by CAF. Am I right in thinking that A, balance snapshots are not a mandatory report, so Castleton wouldn't have had to print one for every day. Castleton did not produce one for every day. For CAF to have collected one for every day, she would have had to attend the branch each day to print one off because the data would have changed each minute of the day, so presumably you couldn't attend the branch, say, once a week and print out historical balance snapshots. Kath certainly wouldn't have had time to attend the branch every day, and that the PO sent me those snapshots that Kath removed in the red folder. Going back, please, to page one, to the top, please. This is Vicky Harrison replying to Stephen Dilley, with you as a recipient as well. Looking, please, to the second paragraph of this email. Vicky Harrison says this. Looking at the events logs from the Horizon Archive for Marine Drive, which I also sent to you, a balanced snapshot was printed most days, and some days more than once by both Christine and Lee throughout Jan to March 04. This report was not mandatory to be printed or retained, so they may well have printed it off and discarded it, as this is used as a rough guide to what the cash variances were compared to the cash on hand. I have never seen the balance snapshots and I don't know about Kath taking them away. Kath, do you remember taking these? It would appear from what Vicky Harrison says in this email, wouldn't it, that contrary to your recollection now, Mr. Castleton did balance snapshots, did did create balance snapshots most days and some days more than once for the period January to March 2004. Would you accept that? Yes, if that's what it said on the event log. Could we have on screen, please, document reference POL 30 73661? This is an email from Vicky Harrison to Stephen Dilley, dated the 7th of December, 2005. And scrolling down a bit, please. She says, Stephen, everyone has now replied to me and therefore this is a joint response to your questions. Questions one and two. Helen Rose did not take away any documentation and the forms she took completed on the day have been forwarded to your office by Stephen Hoff. Kath took the cash accounts from the branch and some snapshots, but she is unable to recall which ones. She also forwarded me some electronic documents which I have attached to the bottom of this email, which you may or n may not already have. So it would appear on the basis of this email that you took away at least some snapshots from the branch. Do you recall doing that? I only do from refreshing my memory from um, the documents and one of the um, interviews where I discussed those snapshots with Mr. Castleton at an interview and they were, they were uh, noted in there. So yes, from, from that I do, but I don't know which ones. Did you ever look at the balance snapshots to try and understand what Mr. Castleton was saying? 
about possible causes of the loss? We looked at the snapshots in one of the interviews. Did you yourself, sorry to stop you there, before the interview, did you yourself look at the documents and try to do any analysis of them before you interviewed Mr Castleton? I'll have looked at them. I, won't, I don't think I'll have tried to do any analysis because the only figures that were in that weren't looking right was obviously the cash figure. All the other figures on, on the snapshot would have been things like the pensions, the gyro banks, the green gyros, all of those, you know, will have been double checked because if they hadn't, they'd have caused an error notice. Did you consider copying the balance snapshots you had and returning them, given that you thought that these were important in, in terms of figuring out what had happened? I think in the interview dated the 10th of May, everything was copied and given back to Mr Castleton. But I don't recall it because it's such a long time ago. Going back, please, to your summary of events. Mm. Um, could we have this back on screen, please? It's LCAS 40699. About halfway down. Following your suggestion about balance snapshots after Mr. Castleton's second apparent shortfall of over £4,000, you contacted Mr. Castleton following the next balance and there was an apparent shortfall of £2,500. Is that right? Yes. You say here that you had a long conversation about how to check the work. By that, do you mean checking Mr Castleton's figures? Yes, and checking everything that was leaving the branch to make sure nothing was leaving incorrect. Can you just clarify what you mean by that? So at that time, there'd be things that would leave the branch on a daily basis, things like any checks that the branch had taken, any gyro deposits, gyro withdrawals, telephone accounts, savings bank deposits and withdrawals, all of those things left each evening. So it was making sure that nothing was leaving the branch that hadn't had, you know, double check and was correct. Do you say here that you suggested the possibility that someone might be stealing the money and Mr. Castleton refused, refuted that suggestion. Yes. You suggested individual stock balancing, yes. but Mr. Castleton did not favour this as the office did not lend itself to individual stock balancing. Is that right? Well, that was Mr. Castleton's opinion. You could do an individual stock unit balance in any branch. The next week, Mr. Castleton had an apparent shortfall of £25 and the week after of £1,500. Um, those are the figures that you've put in your note. So by this point, you say there was a cumulative shortfall of £8,243.10, not counting the £1,100 he had made good. Yes. And your, your only further suggestion at this stage was to get a hardship form, at least in terms of what you've recorded here on your summary of events. Is that right? I did ask him to get a hardship form, yes. I can't recall if we discussed any, to do anything else. And 
And about two thirds of the way down the page, you say this. At this point, I was very concerned and contacted the investigation team. They told me that he had kept me fully informed of the loss. Then they would not be able to prove that, prove dishonesty. Yes. I completed an audit request. What was it that you were so concerned about that led you to contact the investigation team who conduct criminal investigations? I was looking for some help, I think, at that point, and some advice because of the, the large losses. What evidence did you have that Mr Castleton had done anything criminal? I didn't have any evidence that he'd done anything criminal. I don't think that was in my mind. I just wanted some, you know, some sort of help, really. Was it usual for you or other retail line managers to contact the investigation team before an audit had taken place? Um, I don't think I'd contacted them before, but I'd never had anybody with large losses before. I can't speak for, for other retail line managers, but I don't think I had contacted them before. You spoke to someone from the investigation team. Um, did you speak on the phone? Yes, I believe so. And what did you ask that person? Unless it's documented anywhere to recall, I can't remember the conversation. Can you recall what they said to you? And do refer to your summary of events if it helps. Is there anything over and above what you have recorded here that you remember? I don't remember anything over and above what I've put on there, sorry. And what was your reaction at the time to them saying that this was not a matter for criminal investigation? I can't recall, I'm sorry. The next week, Mr Castleton was, you say, £3,509.18 pence short. Yes. And then you say this in your summary. Lee told me that himself and Chrissy, his assistant, had spent hours and hours checking and double-checking transaction logs and worked to try and prove that it was the computer equipment that was changing the figures. I asked him if he had found anything. He hadn't. He is convinced that since he had a processor changed around the time that the losses started, it is that that is causing the losses. Mr. Castleton was at this stage clearly attributing the apparent shortfall to problems with the Horizon system, wasn't he? Yes. And you suggested he contact Horizon and get a system check, is that right? Yes. Did the post office see it as any part of its role? to raise concerns about the Horizon system with Fujitsu on its sub-postmaster's behalf? I can only speak for my role as a retail line manager and we could also ring and ask for different, you know, checks to be done, but it wasn't something that was in the forefront of my mind. To be honest, I wouldn't have given it a thought. I had no idea that there would be any problem with Horizon. Given what Mr Castleton was saying, did you consider at this stage contacting Fujitsu yourself as opposed to directing him to contact Horizon himself? I was just trying to look and see if that 
I can't see the timeline of when I actually contacted them, but we didn't have a direct contact to Fujitsu. We would have to go through the business support center or the Horizon system, uh, the Horizon help desk. You didn't have, there wasn't a direct link, you know, to contact Fujitsu. And I'm not sure at what point I made those calls as well. You say in your summary, I visited the office on Friday the 27th of February 2004. And you say this, we went over everything again. Lee was very distressed and angry. Chrissy, his assistant, was very worked up, upset and angry. They felt that they hadn't received any help and had been left to try and prove that the computer was changing the cash figures. At times they looked close to tears and said they weren't sleeping. On top of all this, Lee's son needed an operation and was going into hospital. The stress levels in the office were high. Yes. Mr. Castleton was at this stage questioning the checks which had been done by Fujitsu, wasn't he? I can't see in my notes where it says that. So we go down another paragraph. I asked them what I could do to help. We had covered all the usual possibilities. Lee and Chrissy kept on that they had not taken the money and that it must be the Horizon kit. Lee said that the Horizon system helpline had said that the checks had been okay, but what had they checked? And your response was to, for him to ring the Horizon helpline back. Again, at this stage, did you consider contacting Fujitsu on Mr. Castleton's behalf, particularly given how distressed you saw him to be? I believe that I was also doing things in the background. Um, I maybe haven't documented on there, um, but I know I've got things from um, the problem manager, you know, from Richard Benton, who had done all the checks and sent that to Fujitsu. Um, I'd got emails back from the Business Support Centre, from Andrew Price and Andrew Wise. Um, so there were, I was doing things as well, um, and asking him, you know, Mr Castleton to do things as well, so that we were both doing things to try and find out. But everything just kept coming back, that everything was fine with the Horizon system. Could we have on screen, please, document reference POL 0007140? This is a record of your interview with Mr. Castleton on the 10th of May 2004. Could we have Page three of this document, please. About halfway down the page, Mr. Castleton says, he said that no one had visited from Horizon to look at his problems and balances. And your response is this. CO explained that Horizon would not attend his office due to poor balances. They would need evidence of a problem which he was unable to provide. She also mentioned that she had given him advice and spent hours and hours on this case and his cash accounts. She asked LC if he could show her a figure that his Horizon system had changed, that the Horizon system had changed, which did not make sense or could prove his allegations. What was the basis for the view you expressed here that Horizon, and by that we can take it to mean Fujitsu, would not attend Mr Castleton's office due to poor balances? They would need evidence of a problem which he was unable to provide. If I remember correctly, I don't think there was any... Um, people that would visit a branch from Fujitsu. 
that just wasn't a possibility, if my understanding is correct. Had you asked anyone from Fujitsu to attend Mr. Castleton's branch by this point? I didn't, as I said earlier, I didn't have a direct contact with Fujitsu. I would have just gone via the Horizon help desk. So where do you think this understanding came from that they would not attend in the circumstances of Mr. Castleton's case? Just from my own experience, I'd never known anybody from Fujitsu to attend a branch for poor balancing. But this was, you said earlier, the first large loss case that you had dealt with, wasn't it? Yes. As far as you were aware, did anyone from the post office ever ask, Fuj ask Fujitsu to send someone out to Mr. Castleton's branch to investigate what was going on? Not that I'm aware, no. Do you remember Anne Chambers, who gave a statement for and oral evidence at Mr. Castleton's trial? I remember her name. I don't actually remember the lady herself. Mrs Chambers has given oral evidence to the inquiry. Could we have the transcript of her evidence given on the 27th of September this year on screen, please? The reference is INQ 50980. Going, please, to page 14 of that document. Are you able to make it any bigger, please? Yes, if you just give us a moment, I'll help the um, RTS people uh, zoom in. Um, so page 14, and we're, what we're looking for is the bottom of internal page 54. If we can zoom in a little bit more to make it easier for Ms Oglesby. Yes, I can, it's quite big enough now, thank you. Counsel to the inquiry is asking Mrs Chambers about the limits on her investigations and he asks this at lines 20 to 22. So your investigation didn't extend to whether there was a problem with the recording of the transactions beyond the extent that you've said. And Mrs Chambers says this, there was no indication of any problem with the recording of the transactions that was visible to me either when I looked in 2004, when it, it's not actually over the page, it's just further down the last page, please. Going over to the left-hand side of the page, obviously there was, you know, more files and things to look at. And then moving over to page 55 at line 18. Mrs Chambers says she could not see, she could not see that without some way of knowing actually what had happened in the branch, at the branch. Counsel to the inquiry says this at line 21. One way of doing that would be to send somebody in on balancing day, for example. Mrs Chambers says yes, or just during normal processes. Counsel to the inquiry, and just watch the sub-postmaster or their clerk do it. And then going to the right side of the page, to the top of internal page 56. Yeah, and to try and keep a record that you could check against at the end of the day. I mean, the, sub the postmaster had a lot of reports that had to be printed out at the end of the day with totals on for pensions and various other things, and I believe that, but this is getting into business stuff, which wasn't, I had less familiar, familiarity with, 
but they were meant to add up the dockets or counterfoils or whatever they'd got for various things and compare them against the totals on the reports to make sure that, that was what was on the system was consistent with the business that they had done. But there was something that I had no way of cross-checking. And the question from counsel to the inquiry is, those, those are two things that could be done to seek to discover where there was, whether there was an underlying problem, and if so, what it was. The answer is absolutely, and it is possible that if those sorts of checks had been done, it might have highlighted some sort of system problem. At the time, my view was that seemed very unlikely, but, or you know, completely unlikely, completely impossible. But in light of where we are now, who knows? So it seems from this that Fujitsu would not have required specific evidence of a system problem in order to visit Mr. Castleton's branch. Was that something that you, can you help us knowing um, this with why it was that you concluded that there would be a need for specific evidence of a system problem? Well, I wasn't aware that Fujitsu would visit a branch. That was that's maybe my naivety, but I wasn't aware of that. I hadn't heard of that at any other branch. But as you say, this was the only one that I was dealing with with, with high losses. Um, the things about the checks around the pensions um, that the lady's talking about there, those were the things that we spoke about earlier when I suggested that everything was double-checked against the reports before it left the branch. Um, those were the things that Mr. Castleton and I discussed him doing before it actually left the branch every day. And he never, I think in all my notes that I've made, he never found one um, error, you know, that the system was making that didn't, didn't correspond with, with the summary. Do you accept that someone from Fujitsu going out to the branch was something which should at least have been explored by the post office in the very unusual circumstances of Mr. Castleton's case? Yes, with hindsight, I think, yes, it should have been. Going back, please, to your summary of events, and if we can have that back on screen, please, LCAS 40699, page 3, And scrolling down a little, please. We can see your summary here of the fact that the apparent shortfalls or apparent losses kept accumulating. And then an audit happens on the 23rd of March, 2004. Yes. And that's exactly it, the penultimate paragraph there. And at the bottom of the page, you discuss your decision to suspend Mr. Castleton on the same day as the audit. What was your reasoning for suspending Mr. Castleton at that point? Um, well, the losses were, we couldn't explain the losses. Um, obviously, Lee was, was upset. Um, and I... The only explanation Lee, Mr. Castleton was coming back with was that it was the Horizon equipment. So I, I really wanted to try and take him and his staff out of the equation and put somebody else in there to see how the branch would balance, to see if it carried on or it stopped. I wanted to, you know, safeguard post office funds as well. We were a lot of money at this point. And the temporary sub postmaster who was put in place at that stage was Ruth Simpson. Is that right? Yes, it is. And so going over the page, please.
we say about three paragraphs down, I asked a very experienced postmaster if she would run the office on a temp basis. Yeah. Did you know Ruth Simpson before you asked her to take up this position? Yes, First Lane Post Office was one of one of the branches in my area. So she was a postmaster in my area. Going please to the top of page five of this document, after Mrs Simpson has spent some time in situ, at the top of the page, you approach the investigation team for a second time and you say this, I spoke to Paul Whitaker from the investigations team again. He said that they didn't wish to take on the case or interview the postmaster as he had kept me fully informed of the situation on a weekly basis. Again, he said that they needed to prove dishonesty and being able to prove this looked unlikely. Why did you raise the question of potential criminality with the investigation team again? I don't remember the exact conversation, but I will have been looking for some support or help from somewhere. I will have been speaking to the contracts team and my line manager, as well as the investigations team. So I was looking for some support, really, and some guidance. And the investigation team said again that they didn't think it was a criminal matter. After this, uh, Greg Booth took over as a temporary sub-postmaster, didn't he? Can you remember why the, there was that change from Ruth Simpson to Greg Booth? Um, Ruth had her own branch and I think she could only uh, commit to a few weeks um, and and so she, she could only commit to a few weeks so I needed to find somebody else. And based on the account that you've included in this summary, it's right, isn't it, <coughs> excuse me, that both temporary sub-postmasters Ms. Simpson and Mr. Booth had some balancing issues, albeit they were small discrepancies. Do you take the time to look back at your summary if you need to? I have written an, another note here. Um, yes, they, were, they had shortages and gains over the, over the weeks that they were there. Could we have on screen, please, uh, document reference POL 3071234? And it's page 14 of that document, please. This is a letter to you and Mrs. Joyce, dated the 28th of April, 2004, from Mr. Castleton. And if we just go to the, um, well, we see the L. Castleton at the top. Um, I, I think you've seen this document before, but. The last page is page 17 of that document, please. Scrolling to the bottom. And we can see there that it's from Lee Castleton. Going back to the first page, please, towards the bottom. Mr. Castleton says this, starting at, on the bottom line, but would like to know, over the page please, whether these losses actually exist or if, as I believe, they are a figment of a computer's imagination. And then he requested a number of things relating to Horizon. And so we have, at one, a full list of all software updates since January 2004 to 28 to now, 28th of April 04, 
at two list of all calls to Horizon and MBSC from this office since 16th of January 2004. Three list of all calls to Horizon and MBSC from any office in relation to computer balance problems that seem unexplained. Four list of any Horizon problems which are either ongoing or have been dealt with including suspense account problems, what action was taken and description of the work. Then over the page, please. At five, a detailed list of the requirements of an RLM in such a case. Six, contractual obligations of Horizon with respect to how and when Horizon should act when a fault on the system is suspected. Seven, what action is taken with data at clear desktop within Horizon. At number eight, detailed breakdown is what is checked during a Horizon system check when system checks have been done on machines. Further information sought there about system checks. At nine, list of BT line faults. And 10, I would also like to know if the computer system has been off over the period of my suspension, the reason for them being off, the actions taken. And just going over to the final page for completeness, any software changes or repairs required to bring the system online again. Your response to Mr. Castleton is at page 18 of this document. Scrolling down a little, please. From you. Going up again, please. To Mr. Castleton, 6th of May, 2004. Including an, a number of documents. But it's right, isn't it, that you didn't provide Mr. Castleton with all of the items he requested in his letter? Yes, that's right. With the benefit of hindsight, do you accept that the post office should have asked for Jitsu to provide the evidence that Mr. Castleton was asking for? I think I did ask for it, um, but I just didn't receive it to be able to pass it to him. And yes, I do agree we should have. Again, with the benefit of hindsight, do you think it was the wrong choice to dismiss him before the questions he had about Horizon had been answered? Well, the decision to dismiss him, because I'd put people into the branch and there were no real I know there were small losses and gains, but that's something you would um, you would expect in any branch. Um, I based, you know, part of my decision on that the Horizon system was was working and was robust. I had no reason to believe it wasn't. Um, with hindsight now, then then maybe it was premature. You set out the reasons for the termination of Mr. Castleton's contract, um, or a summary of those at least. On the last page of your summary document, um, if we can have that back on screen, please, it's LCAS 40699. And it's the penultimate page, in fact, because the last page is blank. About two thirds of the way down the page, you say under the heading Monday, the 10th of May, 2004, RTU interview. At the interview, Lee could only give one explanation for the losses at his office, and that was computer software problems. 
He did not provide any instances where the figures on his cash accounts were incorrect. It was always the cash figure that didn't match. He asked me to explain the discrepancies at the top of his final balances. You go on to say, I sent copies to Liz Morgan and Davlin Cumberland in Leeds, two very experienced suspense account people. They helped me with the wording for my explanation. I sent a letter to Lee on Friday 14th of May, plus the interview notes. Both Liz and Davlin could not see anything wrong with the way the computers were working. And you say, I discussed the whole case with my HOA. You just clarify what that acronym is. Head of area, my line manager. Throughout. My decision is to summary terminate Lee Castleton's contract for services. What did you think had happened to the money represented by this shortfall? I didn't know where the money had gone, um, and that's why we were trying to to look at every you know every aspect of where it, it could have gone. Um, just a, an unexplained loss. It could have been somebody you know taking the money, not necessarily Mr. Castleton. It could have been um, you know the they were doing a really large gyro business deposit from a car auction, and I know the the customer would leave a lot of money there in the branch. You know, that might have been the source of it. We'd talked about that previously, making sure that was correct and things like that. So I didn't know where the, the, the cash had gone. Um, I'd suggested lots of things to try to narrow it down, which Mr Castleton hadn't wanted to do, like the individual balancing. Um, I'd put people in the branch to try to prove to us both really that the horizon system was working correctly so it was just unexplained losses so I didn't know exactly where the money had gone so was it your view that there was a loss did you find that as a matter of fact before you terminated Mr Castleton's contract well, it was a matter of fact that the money was missing, so there was a loss. When it came to the civil proceedings brought by the post office against Mr Castleton, you provided a witness statement. Could we have that on screen, please? It's POL 0010711. And it's paragraph nine of that statement, please. You say, at the material time, the sub-postmaster also had to balance the physical cash and stock against the cash and stock shown on the computers on a weekly basis and produce a cash account. The cash account contained information such as cash and stock in hand at the end of that week, receipts payments, the balance due to the post office, and whether there were any discrepancies such as a surplus or shortfall. The sub-postmaster had to sign the cash account and, of course, should not have done so unless it was accurate. It's right, isn't it, that sub-postmasters might well dispute apparent discrepancies appearing on a final balance, but still roll over into the next trading period to enable them to carry on trading. Did you come across yeah. that? They would declare the loss or the gain, though, and they're signing with the loss or the gain on the account. But the, the case being run by the post office against Mr Castleton... Was it the act of doing that, of signing and rolling over, was an acceptance that the accounts were correct? And you say here, the sub-postmaster had to sign the cash account and of course should not have done so unless it was accurate. But because error notices took time to come through, 
there might well be occasions where cash accounts were confirmed and a sub-postmaster rolled over to allow them to continue trading. When they didn't accept, there was a discrepancy. Do you see that? I, I can see what you're saying, but they, they, would, they, would, they would declare the loss or the gain on the account and then sign and roll over. Is that what you're, you're saying? So they would do that, yes, because but the loss or the gain would be listed, you know, on the account. So if the sub-postmaster doesn't think that there is a loss, they're not accepting the discrepancy that's there on the draft, if we can put it in that way, accounts. They don't, they don't agree that there is a discrepancy. There might be an error notice out there, there might not, but they don't agree with that discrepancy. What you're saying here is the sub-postmaster had to sign the cash account and, of course, he should not have done so unless it was accurate. There were often times, weren't there, when sub-postmasters would not think a discrepancy was accurate and there was an error notice in the pipeline or another reason. But they had to roll over, didn't they, to carry on into the next trading period? Yes, but they'd still be signing the account to say that that was accurate, the cash and stock was accurate, and at that point in time, there was also a discrepancy. So that would be a loss or a gain. So they're just they're signing the account, you know, to say that's accurate at that point, with the loss or the gain in there. What would have happened if Mr. Castleton had refused to sign the cash account which showed the loss, or the apparent loss? Well, nothing that would have happened that I could think of. Would he have been able to roll over into the next trading period? Without signing, yes, it would. Yeah, he would still roll the he would still roll the branch over into the next period. It's only a signature on a document. You could still physically do that on the machine. So those are the questions that I have for Ms Oglesby. Um, I'll turn now to call participants to see if there are any questions. Mr. Henry has some questions, sir. Yeah. Ms. Oglesby, in the past, sub-postmasters were prosecuted on data, in other words, the books they generated and were responsible for, which they had constructed and signed off themselves and were indisputably accountable for. You agree with that, don't you? Before Horizon. Oh, before Horizon, yes, it was a book. Yeah. Now they were being judged on data generated by Horizon, which they could not interrogate or control, correct? Well, they could check the documentation that Horizon then would be, be summarising, so that all the documentation could be cross-referenced against the figures on Horizon. But they were not in control of it. Could you explain what you mean, please? Well, it was generated by Horizon itself, and they could not check how Horizon performed the calculations. But they could check, so for example, if we just take an example, the, say the pension dockets, there would be a, a counterfoil for each pension that would have been inputted into Horizon and then the total on Horizon for the pensions, you could physically add up, as we used to do before Horizon, physically add them up and cross-reference them with the figure on Horizon. So you could double-check all of the entries. But you're assuming that the system is bug, error, and defect-free when saying that, aren't you? Yes, I am, yes. Right. I'll move on. Janet Skinner, 
Um, paragraph 89 of your witness statement, you recognised the name Janet Skinner, didn't you? Yes, I do. And she worked in your area for years. And, uh, in fact, you were her area manager at one time, weren't you? Yes, I was. And you knew that she was um, an experienced um, sub-postmaster. Well, she was an employee, I believe. Well, she was... Um, she was experienced and well-regarded. You knew that. I don't know how long... I can't remember because it's quite some time ago how long she'd worked there, but I just know that I knew the name, Janet Skinner, and I had she had been in my area at one of the branches. I couldn't recall which one and now. Right. But, yes, I did know her. Fine. She was dismissed and prosecuted in May 2006, and you were aware of that, weren't you? Um, yes, I was aware of it. I didn't know the details of the case. And as um, RLM in that general area, um, you would have also become aware that the temporary SPM who came after her, just like Mrs Skinner before her, <coughs> was investigated for stealing money. Do you remember that? Wendy Lyle. I don't. I'm sorry. I, the name doesn't ring a bell at all with me. Well, that the person who replaced Janet Skinner was arrested for theft. So you had an experienced member of staff, Janet Skinner, who'd suddenly encouraged large losses and was arrested. And then you had her replacement, Wendy Lyle, who also uh, incurred large losses and was arrested. Did that cause you to think that there might be something wrong with the system? Well, you say I knew all of this, but I wasn't, I'd moved roles in 2005, so I don't, I can't recall, you know, knowing that information. Would you, I mean, you've earlier accepted that you did know that Janet Skinner had been prosecuted. Uh, you didn't think that this was worth mentioning when you gave evidence against Lee Castleton in December 2006, did you? I don't know at what point I became aware, whether I would, you know, this is going back some 20 years, I don't know whether I would have known at that point or not, so I wouldn't like to say if I'd have known and I would have mentioned it, so I'm presuming I didn't know. Uh, I want to just briefly touch on the witness statement, no need to put it up, but do you not recall that at paragraph 53 of your witness statement, which was page 15 of the statement that you filed in that case, you, you said the following. Since Mr. Castleton has been suspended, the temporary sub-postmasters had worked with exactly the same horizon kit, and the balance had continued to be fine each day within expected parameters. Mr. Castleton had not given any credible explanation for the unauthorized shortfalls. In these circumstances, I decided to terminate summarily. That wasn't accurate, was it? Which part? Well, we know, don't we, that Mrs Simpson was having difficulties and there were shortfalls, weren't there? And there were, um, there, were, there were discrepancies above and below the line, weren't there? Mrs Simpson wasn't having difficulties. She had one particular error of a hundred pounds which she did have an explanation for which Didn't, was sorry, oh, sorry you carry on please which she thought her staff member had left an amount in the stack on horizon and, and paid it out um, a second time which she'd previously done i believe at her own branch um, all the others were all the other losses and gains that i've noted um, were sort of under the £20 limit, really, you know, and, and some were over and some were short. She, she didn't process the lottery transactions, even though they were there from her first day, did she? Unless you can show me my notes, I don't recall, I'm sorry. Well, I'm under somewhat, some pressure of time, so if I might just ask you to recall this... She didn't use Horizon until 11.30 a.m. on the 1st of April, 2004, did she? 
I'm sorry, that's going back Because to of a crash, it crashed. Do you not recall her saying that it had to be rebooted? Uh, and then she offered a different explanation, so a mutually inconsistent explanation, that uh, it hadn't crashed, but she just decided to work manually. I can't recall that, I'm sorry. I, I suggest that there were evident problems with Horizon when Ruth Simpson took over and uh, no one was being frank about it. Isn't that right? No, I don't agree. Um, could I ask you please to consider the answers you've given to uh, counsel to the inquiry? Um, and I'm going to ask if you might have been displaying a degree of um, bias against Mr. Castleton uh, and that you actually thought that he was dishonest. What do you have to say to that? No, I didn't think he was dishonest. I was trying to find an explanation um, and help and support him to try and find where the errors were. Why did you speak to Mr. Paul Whitaker twice in the criminal investigations team, why did you speak to Mr. Paul Whitaker twice? To try and get some support, because obviously I was very concerned at the, the losses. So it was to try and get some help and support with it. But you wouldn't go to the criminal investigation team for that, particularly since he had told you emphatically that Mr. Castleton was not dishonest, that he had been frank about the losses and had brought them to you, correct? And he said that to you on two occasions? Yes, he did. Right. Uh, I, what I'm going to suggest is that it would have far better suited your narrative, made it a lot easier for you, if Mr. Castleton was dishonest, Horizon was robust, and you could have got a confiscation order against him in the criminal courts. Isn't that the truth? That's the way you were thinking at the time. I was, I didn't think for one minute that the Horizon system wasn't robust. Every time I'd asked anybody to check anything, everything came back that the Horizon system was fine. So, you know, I was trying to, to help Mr. Castleton and try and find out where, and get help from other people, you know, in the business. Yeah. You see, what you ought to have done, rather than calling the criminal investigation team, was to bombard Fujitsu with requests. That's what you ought to have done, Mrs. Oglesby. Don't you accept that now? With hindsight, yes, probably. Hmm. So uh, I, I put it to you again that the reason why you twice contacted the criminal investigation team was because you hoped you could persuade them to take on this case. I was looking for help and support, that's why I contacted them. That's your answer? Yes. Right. Um, can I um, ask you please to uh, just deal with um, paperwork? Um, did you not remove paperwork from Mr Castleton during his suspension? balance snapshots, transactional logs, purportedly to get them analysed. Do you remember that? I believe I took them at the audit, unless I've made a note for when I took them. I think I took some at the audit. He did exactly as you'd suggested, contrary to what you say in paragraph 60 of your statement to the inquiry. He did exactly as you suggested. He took repeated snapshots, balanced snapshots. He also annotated transactional logs, and they were taken away by you, weren't they? I did take some balances and some snapshots, which we discussed at his interview on the 10th of May, and which I gave him copies back of, and that's stated in there. I, su I, didn't I suggest that's not true. You did not give him back copies and they were never returned to him. I'm Your memory is playing tricks. 
And I'll, if you can just have a moment to find the notes from the interview, that's all I'm going on is the, is the notes there. Just a second. Can I have a... I'm just looking at the notes of the 10th of May. I won't be a moment. I'm sure it says on there that we discussed them and copies were given. Yes, it does. It says we went on a detail to discuss the balances, error notices, snapshots and cash declarations copies of all this information is provided with a list of all the results of the balance. So that's what I was going on from But that there. was not provided to him. That was provided to you. You were provided with his originals and they were never returned. Well, my understanding was he got copies of those and then the originals were put in the file and given um, as part of the appeal process. Everything was put together. Ms. Ogilvy, this was the subject of a complaint by him, subject of a complaint by him that he hadn't had the material returned to him and that it hamstrung his action against the post office. Don't you recall that? Well, my understanding is that he got copies of that. I see. I ask you no further questions. Does anyone else wish to ask any questions? Uh, no, sir. No further questions from core participants. Right. Well, thank you, Mrs. Ogilvy, for making your uh, written statement and for answering questions from Ms. Price and Mr. Henry. Um, and that concludes, I believe, today's business, yes, Ms. Price? Yes, sir. Um, we return tomorrow at 10 o'clock uh, for Tony Utting. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, sir.